Welcome to today's webinar featuring New York Winter Energy Market Outlook. My name is Mark Levine. I'm the Deputy Director of your New York State Association of Counties, and I'm the Executive Director of the Municipal Electric and Gas Alliance, MEGA. MEGA was created 26 years ago by two counties to serve the energy supply needs of counties, local governments, and school districts across the state. We currently provide electricity and natural gas to 30 counties and more than 240 local governments and schools. Part of MEGA's mission is to provide energy-related resources and training to help local leaders make more informed decisions. The long-standing partnership between MEGA and NISAC helps us achieve that mission for our collective membership. And that couldn't be more important than in the energy transition that we all find ourselves here in New York and around the world. MEGA does a public procurement through one of our members, Genesee County, uh, and we help to choose the most competitively priced suppliers and we include language that allows all other local governments in New York to piggyback off of the contract with these bid winners. Our last two procurements were conducted through Genesee County, and the winner of those natural gas supply bids was NRG. Today, we have an expert team from NRG with us this morning to discuss how the winter weather forecast, the winter weather forecast could impact energy markets over the next several months. They will also provide some cost management strategies to help keep budgets under control. Before we begin, we have a few brief housekeeping announcements. Jeanette Stanziano is our Director of Education and Training. Jeanette, thanks for coordinating today's webinar. Thanks, Mark. Happy to be here. Just want to let everyone know that this session will be recorded as we do with all of our webinars. And you can find the recording later today on the MEGA website. You can either rewatch it or let other colleagues know that it's available for their viewing. During the program, we want to encourage you to submit any questions you might have for our presenters this morning. To do so, just refer to the dashboard click on the questions tab and type in your question at any time during the event. At the end of the presentations, we will have a Q&A session moderated by Mark and we will go over all questions that we have time for. Back to you, Mark. Thank you, Jeanette. Our speakers today, it's my pleasure to introduce Eric Lister. He serves as the client strategist for the East region for NRG and works with NRG's customers in the um, upstate New York portfolio. Eric works with customers to strategize on energy procurement and managing risk through utilization of market insights and various advanced analytics. Eric is responsible for ensuring customers make the most informed decisions around their energy purchasing strategies and providing a high level of service in the process. Eric has worked in the energy industry for seven years, beginning his career in energy management under a building operations team for a large commercial building working in energy procurement and demand management strategies surrounding capacity reduction and demand response. Zane Kirshner currently serves on NRG's technical sales team as the technical sales representative for the PJM Mid-Atlantic region. The technical sales team work with, works with sales account executives to offer energy solutions to customers. The solutions include complex retail gas and electric products, renewable services, and demand side capabilities. Zane has 20 years of experience in the wholesale and retail energy markets, including working with some of NRG's largest key customers to develop and implement energy procurement strategies. We also have with us today, Dylan Haas, who is um, the Meg Mega's um, uh, client, um, uh, client sales team 
and we appreciate all of you being with us today. And at this point, I'd like to turn it over to our panel. Thanks, Mark. Good morning, everyone. Again, my name is Eric Lister, and I'm client strategist for New York with NRG. So to start off, I wanted to first take a look at what weather has looked like for the previous summer and winter seasons, particularly for the Northeast region compared to the rest of the country. Both maps here are showing average temperature deviations from climate normals for each season, indicated by the positive or negative numbers across the map. The map on the left side of the screen, which summarized this past winter, indicates that this was the warmest winter on record nationally dating back to 1950. For New York specifically, this is even further above average when compared to the nation as a whole. Taking a look at the map on the right for summer 2024, we see that the entirety of the summer made up the fifth warmest on record since 1950. The majority of the above average heat came out of the Southwest region, while the Northeast also had a generally above average summer. The takeaway here is that the New York ISO and Northeast region as a whole has experienced very mild weather last winter, keeping natural gas reserves strong and keeping storing storage levels healthy through the summer season despite above average temperatures. Next slide. With that being said, let's take a look at where we anticipate this upcoming winter season to take us. According to the forecast generated by our NRG meteorology team shown here, we are anticipating elevated average temperatures from uh, December through February across the East Coast, which we've certainly been feeling with the warmest start to fall over the last few weeks here in the Northeast. There are several var variables driving this forecast, primarily the transition from El Nino to La Nina. As for the colder risks associated with these macro weather patterns, a La Nina winter historically has brought on increased cold volatility. Previous winters with similar patterns have generated events such as Winter Storm Uri in 2021 and Winter Storm Elliot in 2022. Overall, these predictions are anticipating this winter to come in as the 10th warmest on record. Next. Now looking at natural gas supply, the US natural gas market has experienced a low price environment for quite a while, mostly due to flat demand and healthy underground storage levels. For reference, the August and September contract settled at just above $1.90. More recently, October and November have both settled in the mid $2 handle. Due to these low recent settlements, several producers have curtailed production over the September-October timeframe with the goal of tightening the supply-demand balance. This can be observed in the production trend in the top right. Production is down about 2 to 3 BCF per day since early August, hovering around the 101 BCF per day mark that was recognized earlier this year during the initial round of strategic curtailments. Based on the recent short-term energy outlook, the EIA forecast production will remain unchanged over the next several months until we see a rise in prices. They're calling for an average of 104 BCF per day in Q4 24 and 105 BCF per day during 2025, where most of the natural gas production growth comes in late 2025 when new LNG facilities ramp up their production. Not only is the natural gas production trend being impacted, but if you take a look at the rig count chart on the upper left-hand side, natural gas rigs have been downward trending since about May of 2023. Generally speaking, rig counts can almost be viewed as an indicator of future production. When rig counts decrease, it suggests that less wells are being drilled, which could lead to lower future production. The interesting part of the conversation is the relationship between rig counts and duck wells. That's DUC. You, uh, sorry, duck wells are partially completed sources of supply. Duck stands for drilled but uncompleted. They represent a form of inventory that could be quickly brought online when needed at a lower cost than new drills. Duck wells are important because they provide production flexibility. And when natural gas prices are favorable, companies can quickly complete these wells to increase production without the need for new, uh, new drilling. The number of rigs can be a leading indicator of future duck well counts. When rigs decrease, it often leads to a decline in the number of duck wells over time. In summary, as rig counts are on the decline, this could not only lead to lower future production, but also lead to more expensive forms of production as duck well counts are dwindling. As supply conditions are potentially beginning to tighten, it's important to understand both short-term and long-term demand projections. Next. Over the last couple of years, the demand sectors that have started to steal the spotlight are LNG export demand and power burn demand. Power burn demand year-to-date has remained mostly elevated versus historical levels. 
This could continue in the short term as above average temperatures are in the forecast for most of the nation over the next month. Since the end of last winter, other than some dips for planned or unplanned outages, LNG demand has remained mostly flat around the 13 BCF per day mark, which is about two BCF per day off our max capacity of 15 BCF per day. Some near-term LNG news that may impact uh, export volumes have been coming out, such as Golden Pass, which recently delayed uh, its in-service date from the first half of 2025 to the second half, and filed for pro project completion extensions until 2029 which could be an indicator of further delays. Plot and Mines is another one that is pl uh, planned to continue to ramp up their uh, exports to one BCF per day by the end of this year. Its sole capacity is about two and a half BCF, which could continue to ramp up throughout 2025. From a global LNG demand standpoint, current underground storage levels throughout Europe are approximately 93% full, which could keep a cap on LNG export demand. Lastly, industrial and rescom demand historically play a large role during the winter season. Amid the consistent and rising LNG demand, if the market does experience more normal winter weather conditions or average, we could see elevated total natural gas demand this winter when compared against historical trends. With demand in the short term projected to remain elevated and supply levels on the decline, this could lead to tightening conditions that could affect underground storage projections. Next. Underground storage can almost be viewed as insurance against the unknown. Higher the storage level, the greater the market can deal with imbalances in supply demand, such as extreme weather or unplanned production outages. The storage surplus throughout this past year has kept a cap on near-term price volatility. If you reference the top chart from the EIA, the weekly storage injections over the summer have continued to fall under the five-year average injection levels. This has dwindled down the storage surplus that we've had, approaching levels seen back towards historical averages. Based on the EIA's recent short-term energy outlook, they forecast inventories will end the injection season with 5% more natural gas than the five-year average. In summary, as supply and demand balances are presenting tightening conditions, the forward curve may become increasingly reactive to near-term fundamental changes. Next. As we discussed a couple slides ago, Current LNG demand is approximately 12 to 13 BCF per day versus our max capacity of about 15 BCF per day. Based on the EIA's forecast, North American LNG capacity build out is set to significantly grow by 2028, nearly doubling current capacity. This is the biggest demand driver in North America over the next decade, with the second wave of LNG capacity expansion projects set to start exports this winter. Over the course of 2025, about 5 BCF per day of LNG export capacity growth is expected. This will increase national capacity to around 20 BCF per day by the start of 2026. However, recent headwinds have developed. There's been a government moratorium on LNG announced earlier this year, which has been challenged and put on hold. However, the Department of Energy disagreed with the ruling and has yet to approve any permits of major US-based projects. In September, the DOE approved uh, did approve a small offshore facility in Mexico to export LNG to non-free trade agreement countries, signaling a potential change in the regulatory approvals for LNG. This approval was for a five-year export to non-free trading country, which uh, is differs from usual long-term license. This will not have an impact on already approved projects, but could just impact further long-term growth. Another factor potentially impacting US LNG export growth is global market competition from LNG suppliers such as Qatar, which could outpace global demand by 2029, leading to an oversaturated market. This may impact US export economics, adding bearish risks to the market if shut-ins are required to balance global supplies. Next. These fundamentals all point to where we have seen NYMEX pricing settling year to date, as well as the forward market and where it's shifted for near and long-term pricing as we progress through the year. The chart on the left here shows monthly NYMEX settles in the solid line alongside forward pricing marked by the dashed lines. Forward pricing for the near term has changed dramatically over the last year with the absence of extreme weather and generally bearish fundamentals. Since late 2022, the forward market has shifted from a backwardated pattern into a contango pattern. However, despite recent months settling in the high $1 to mid $2 handle, the market hasn't forgotten what high pricing, uh, the high pricing that we experienced back in 2022. 
This combined with bullish anticipations for natural gas demand domestically and internationally in the coming years create the premium that we are currently seeing long term, which is still which still has relaxed a bit over the last two years of trading. Taking a look at regional basis pricing, the chart on the right shows the trading histories for Transco Zone 6 New York basis, which represent flat, unweighted calendar strips. Over the last two years, we've seen pricing move from a high volatility environment, similar to how NYMEX was reacting to international conflict back in 2022, and then relaxing back downward with the lack of extreme winter or summer weather throughout 2024. While this chart indicates the basis trend for Transco Zone 6 New York, the Algonquin and Iroquois Zone 2 pipeline prices have been trending in a similar fashion over the last year or so. Looking at where NYMEX and regional basis pricing have trended, a potential strategy is to take advantage of our NYMEX Plus product. With this product, you have the ability to lock in a longer term fixed basis to capitalize on this low pricing, and then later on lock in triggers on the commodity portion for the lower price near term environment while setting targets for longer term strips of your contract. Next. Now, quick notes on a few you know, regional considerations here. Uh, overall, volatility in national power and gas markets was mostly muted over this past summer, with low pricing seen in most markets compared against historical trends. Starting with the Midcom market, Mountain Valley Pipeline is a 2BCF pipeline that moves gas from the Appalachian Basin, which is mostly the Ohio PA markets, down to Virginia and the Carolinas via the Transco Pipeline. The pipeline came into flow about mid-June of this year and is currently operating around 50% of operating capacity. But flow constraints on the Transco pipeline and lower regional production are restricting, restricting this pipeline from increasing flows for the interim. With expansion projects on the Transco pipeline slated over the next couple of years, the pipeline flows are expected to continue to ramp up as space allows. Now looking at the Northeast, Global LNG prices have recently softened, which has a bearish impact on gas power prices for the region. The Northeast receives a large share of its natural gas from LNG imports due to limited pipeline capacity. And since there is a high use of natural gas in the power generation mix, there is a strengthening correlation in natural gas and power trends for the region. There is currently an Algonquin gas transmission rate case pending that has the potential to lead to a 218% increase in transportation rates. A decision is expected uh, by December 1st here, but they have indicated there is not a ruling by then. They might start changing the higher rates and issue a rebate afterwards. And lastly, in July, for the Northeast, uh, the Vineyard Wind Project went offline due to a turbine blade failure, which uh, in this outage reduced the regional generation availability by about 805 megawatts. And now wrapping it up in the West, looking at California, California gas storage is uh, continues to trend at a healthy surplus compared to historical averages, which is bearish for both natural gas basis pricing and helping keep a cap on power price volatility. The new Costa Azul LNG facility in Mexico delayed from summer 2020, 2025 excuse me, to spring 26, leading to reduced basis pricing pressure for next summer. And then lastly for Texas, overall, there is higher renewable and power storage participation in the energy market, which was coupled with milder weather, which has resulted in lower index clears for summer 2024. Although significant forecasted load growth continues to play a large part in longer term fundamentals. This is stemming from uh, growth in data centers, industrial load, and residential population. That wraps up Excuse me, that wraps up everything I had for today's webinar. I will now pass it along to Zane Kirshner. Thank you, everyone. Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Eric. So I'm gonna be talking about curtailment incentives today, specifically the demand response program in, in New York. Um, as mentioned earlier, I primarily support the Mid-Atlantic region, you know, the PJM ISO, but I also now support the uh, upstate New York region. So I, I am the uh, technical sales expert on, on New York demand response. So what exactly is demand response? This is basically just simply a way for customers to recover some of their costs, to get paid to curtail usage. The way to think about it is a power generator has two flows of, of revenues. They have the energy revenues, which is what's tied to the, the wholesale traded market. And there are, are also capacity revenues, which is basically almost a standby charge. 
that it, it capacity payment is made to a generator even if they're even if they're not coming online uh they're just there to to be available during a potential emergency situation those two flows of payments are how generators make money on the demand response in the demand response program when a customer curtails load that is effectively the same thing as bringing on a power generator and the way the independent system operators which is like new york the new york iso how so they want to treat the load almost as if they are a generator for curtailing consumption and the, the whole goal is to as you can see on here reduce price price spikes uh but the, the big thing really is to prevent the less efficient dirty fossil fuel power generators from needing to come online so demand response is also a form of a sustainability play because as you curtail consumption you are you are preventing those less less efficient oil fire power plants from coming on online um, moving on to the next slide how does the demand and response program work the the first step is to get a contract in place and demand response contracts are actually quite simple especially when compared to a gas contract or an electric contract um, all you're contracting for is the term of the agreement um, for how long you want to par potentially participate in the demand response program and then uh, what's called the the customer split um, the, the customer typically receives the, a high percentage of the payments, but then NRG or the curtailment service provider, we hold on to a smaller percentage just to, because the costs to, to enroll customers into the pro program, there's a lot of steps that need to be taken. So those are effectively the only two things being contracted. Um, the amount of curtailment that's enrolled in the program, that does not need to be determined when the contract is signed that amount of enrollment in the program changes constantly which is why it's not in in the contract so the first step like i mentioned in the demand response program is to get a contract signed once the contract is signed the first step is to get metering installed so any customer that participates in this program gets a free data logger courtesy of NRG. And this data logger, it allows, allows you to view your electric consumption in real time. It helps for planning purposes. It helps you identify some, some equipment that could potentially be shut down during an emergency period. So that's one of the first things we like to get installed when the contract is signed, because like I said, it will help you determine what you are actually capable of curtailing during a potential emergency event. The next step in the process would be to have what's called a reduction action plan. A lot of customers, they always come to us and say, how, how do I determine what I can curtail? You would have a meeting with NRG's demand response engineer, and he is has a vast wealth of knowledge of different equipment, of what can possibly be curtailed, and he would just have a conversation uh, with the the site's on-site engineer and, and come to an agreement on what equipment could be curtailed and the amount of kilowatts that that would tra translate into. Next up, if there's an activation, oh, go back. So now if there's a, an act activation of an event, this is when there is an emergency situation on the grid when the load forecast is expected to hit a certain level that is when new york iso will activate the potential event and as you'll see in a couple of slides there is some decent notification that it's not an instance where you're just getting called and then instantly you need to curtail there is a good amount of lead time notification you would determine you would you would let us know who should be called if there is an event the the iso would reach out those those people would be notified and then they could put their plans in place of the steps to to start curtailing that consumption 
after the fact, after the event, there are performance reports to see exactly how you did perform during that event. And then lastly, your payment is based off of your performance. And the best part about this whole program is that there are no out-of-pocket penalties. You only get paid for what you perform. If you enroll in the program, and if there is an emergency situation, and if you're unable to curtail, um, if there's maybe a safety concern or you're not able to reduce your load, you just don't get paid. There's no out-of-pocket penalties that you would ever that you would ever incur. And this is where where the, the, the customer always says, come on, there's got to be a catch. You know, what is the catch with this? And there is none. There is no chance of getting an out-of-pocket penalty for, for participating in this program. It is truly pay for performance. Okay, moving on to the, to the next slide. The, the big question always becomes, like I said earlier, what can I actually curtail? For commercial buildings, we'll focus on that. The, the big pieces are simply HVAC and, and lighting. And you'd be shocked at how much consumption really is attributed to, to both of those. And the really what what, what the, the goal is and what you want to do is with HVAC, you just do some pre-cooling. You're going to be notified the day before you're going to find out if there's going to be an event for the next day. And when you have an idea of when that event is going to happen, you just turn up your HVAC as high as, you know, as, as the, mo the most you can to start pre-cooling to the best of your ability. It might get a little chilly, but then once you get to that point, when the event happens, just cut the HVAC. And now all of a sudden, now you're curta curtailing and you're pulling less from the grid during that emergency situation. The other important piece is lighting. You can walk around, you can shut off some lights. I know it can Maybe it's a tedious process, but ultimately it's up to each site to determine what they're willing and able to do. And if shutting off lights is is something that is, that is feasible, you can shut off a lot of lights at one time just for a brief period. It could be two to four hours. That's, that is another big method of being able to, to shed load and ultimately get, get paid for shedding that load. The perfect example I like to use, I was in, visiting a customer in person a couple of months ago. It, and they had a, a very big ballroom and they always said, we, we can't curtail. We have, there's nothing that we can do that we, that, that'll allow us to reduce usage during these, uh, during these emergency, emergency periods. And, and I looked at him and I said, this ballroom, we're sitting in a massive ballroom. Every single light was on that ballroom was only, there was only three people in that room and the entire thing was on. I said, right, there's one thing, shut all those lights off. Any little bit can help. And like I said, it's paid for performance. So even if you only are able to curtail 25 KW, you're still going to get some kind of, of payment. Moving on to the next slide. I mentioned about the, the metering that NRG provides at no cost. Not only is this great for demand response, it just gives you good insight into what your facility is actually doing and what, what you're able to, to curtail. And having that real-time visibility with an online platform to see what your consumption is, it, it's something that is, is very popular among a lot, of, a lot of customers. Even if you don't intend to enroll a lot in, in the program, this still can be used to help reduce your, your capacity tags. Uh, you know, a big part of your cost in your electric invoice is is a capacity cost, and that's based off of what you're consuming during New York's peak time period. And if you're able to curtail during that time period as well, that can greatly reduce your electric spend on your electric invoice. This AMP platform can go a long way in helping you figure out what you can curtail during those peak periods that will have an impact on your overall electric spend. So AMP is one of the top platforms in the industry for real-time monitoring, and it's a very simple installation. We don't have we don't have to cut load to your facility. You just go in, we, we slap a little data logger on by the, the main meter, and the location, there is nothing that that is noticed at the at the location when 
when these meters are are installed. Okay, moving on. Now I'm going to talk about some of the specifics with the program. There are actually multiple demand response programs in New York. The first one here, as you can see, this is called the Special Case Resource. This is the main program that is administered by the New York ISO. There is also another utility program that I will touch on in a little bit. So there are multiple programs that customers are able to enroll in and get a couple different flows of payments. You don't have to enroll in both. You can pick one or the other, but if you're able to curtail at all, it's in your best interest to just enroll in, in, both, in both of the programs. So the main program is a, is a year-long program. It covers winter and summer. The summer months are May to October. The winter months are November from April. And you can be called any day. Events can happen at, at any point with the exception of holidays. The baseline, we always get a question on well, what's the starting point. So the baseline for the SCR program, this is, this is called the average coincidental peak. And it's based on the zone's top 40 usage hours in a season. And we look at how the facility is run during those hours and we take the average of that customer's highest 20 usages in that in those 40 hours of the zonal top might seem a little confusing but ultimately it's just a calculation that allows us to figure out what your running baseline is and then what you agree upon beforehand is basically what level you can get down to during an emergency event and then you get paid for the difference between that ACL and what level you say you can get down to during that emergency situation. The event trigger is typically when the system peaks. That's when we are most likely to see potential emergency events. The whole point is of this program is to eliminate potential brownouts and blackouts when the system is stressed at the most. The number of events, they can happen. There are unlimited events, but they are very infrequent. We, it is rare to, um, and actually the next slide when I get to it, you'll see that there are very infrequent times that customers actually do need to curtail by being in this program. As for the notice, you actually do get a day ahead notice to be on standby that there is the potential for an, an event to happen the next day. They tell you to be ready to go and there is a chance that the event does not happen, but at least you're getting a day ahead notice and it, it allows you to prep and plan for that event and plenty of lead time that gives you that ability, better ability to perform and ultimately get paid. Duration, they can be unlimited, but on average over the last couple of years, the, during the actual events, you're looking at a six to seven hour reduction is how long the events are. If you're unable to curtail for that full six or seven hours, let's say you, you do the, the pre-cooling and then you shut down your, your HVAC and then all of a sudden it starts getting hot inside again, you can bring that you can bring the AC back online and then you would just get paid for what you did perform. There is also a test requirement. And if there is no events, that is what your payments are based off of. And in 2023, in the SCR program, there were no emergency events. So customers only had to participate in uh, two one hour tests, one in the summer, one in the winter and then whatever whatever their performance was during that short one hour test that is what determined their payouts and if you were able to curtail for that one hour at a hundred percent you would get 100 percent of your expected payment moving on to the next slide you will see what the event history has been and like i said we don't usually see too many events and especially on here you don't see many 
in upstate New York. You had Zone F had had two events back in 2022, and it was on July 19th and 20th. And then you can see where the one-hour tests were were made. Typically, February timeframe for the winter test, and right around the end of August for for that summer test. 2023, like I mentioned, there were no emergency events. So you only needed over the course of 2023, you only needed to curtail twice, only and once for an hour. And the and as you'll see later, the, the payments are are pretty can be pretty sizable for for participating in in the program. Uh, moving on to the Next slide, I'm gonna to touch on the actual, oh, well, here's the payment set. Like, it's probably most important to talk about the, this before I move on to the other, to the utility program. I know one megawatt may be difficult to enroll for a, a lot of the locations that might be listening in right now, but you can enroll as low as, uh, we like to look for at least 100 KW curtailment. Um, sometimes we might make exceptions to go even lower, depending on how reliable that location, how how reliable we believe that location can can be. But New York City obviously is going to be that's where you're going to see the most um, potential for emergency events. Payments are very strong in New York City, as you can see on here. Uh, we're going to look mostly for this group. Rest of state is is going to be the payments that are more in line with with what most of the locations would see. And between summer and winter, you'd be looking at about a twenty one thousand dollar payment for a one megawatt enrollment in in the program. If you can only do one hundred kW, the payment is only going to be around is only going to be around two thousand dollars. But still, since it is paid for performance, there is no pocket out-of-pocket penalties can't hurt to still sign up and get get in into into the program moving now moving on to the utility program that i mentioned that is the um, csrp program to so move on to the next slide the commercial system Re relief program this is run through the actual utility and but the concept is the same you get called to curtail and when you get called, if you curtail, if you perform, you get paid. This program is a summer only program. It only happens from May through September. So there is nothing that could ever be called in these utility programs in the winter months. These are four hour events. They are a set duration of four hours. And you also get the same day ahead notice. So you know when these events are likely to happen you can see the event triggers on here the specific percentage of the forecast the summer wide peak if you hit 92 percent of the summer system wide peak or if that's what the forecast is you can see those utilities right there natural grid, grid and ISAC, they would then call um, a demand response event and then you would be expected to curtail for uh, for that four hour period uh, moving on to the next slide, I believe we have the payments for this program as, as well. Not quite as lucrative as the as the uh, SCR program, but but they're still not still not bad. That uh, one megawatt enrollment in some of the upstate zones you can be ten to to fifteen thousand dollars. So now if you enroll in both programs and have the ability to shed a megawatt of load during during an event, you could be looking at, at a payment of close to, to $30,000. Really, it all comes down to you know having a discussion with the personnel on site, um, looking at the dollars, you know, 30,000, is, is it worth it? Ultimately, it is up to each location to determine that. Um, and if the dollars don't make sense, then obviously you just pass and you don't enroll in the program. But we just like to bring this program up and make everyone aware, basically in the state of New York, that this is an available option to at least get some money back. And in the current environment with higher electric prices, it seems like prices just continuously rise, getting any little bit back can help. Uh, I believe that was it for, for me. Turn it over, I believe, to the Q&A session. Great. Uh, thank you, Zane, and thank you, Eric. I do have a couple of questions here, but I want to remind attendees that we, ha <laughs> we have an expert panel here from NRG, so 
Uh, if you have a question, please type it into the questions panel in your uh, go to webinar dashboard. First question is for Eric. Eric, um, back in your slides, um, you, you mentioned um, uh, some non-New York regional um, uh, um, supply issues. Why should New York customers, why should mega members and, and counties who are responsible for purchasing energy be paying attention to um, other regions of the country? That's a great question, Mark. Thank you. Um, so I would kind of summarize that by saying, you know, although the New York region is where you're all situated, uh, as you know, we're talking about natural gas, right? It's going to be two components, your basis, which is going to be regionally driven, as well as the commodity portion, which is a national figure, right? Or national national price. Um, so fundamentals across the nation kind of all help to shape that, you know, such as large growth of demand for our data centers in the mid Midwest, or increased demand for natural gas generation, you know, for years out, whatever it may be, all that impacts the national supply demand balance, which all ultimately ties into your bill. So it just helps to consider the entire market landscape, um, you know, since since that's a more pricier part of the, uh, the gas spend. Great, thank you. Now I'm looking outside my window in my office. It's 70 degrees here in the in early November, which is is not normal. Um, so if we're looking at another a stretch of another month, say, of some um, some weather that it's not really cold um, and, and uh, we start to get into winter um, when it's, uh, you know, we're not seeing uh, the, the potential of volatility of weather. Um, what, what sh at what point will we know weather is going to impact the energy pricing? Um, and I ask that this uh, in, in part for those members who have a renewal date sometime between now and say April, when should they be looking at locking in pricing over the course of the next 12, 24, 36 months? It's another great question, right? And, you know, we like to say in our team, unfortunately, we don't have a crystal ball, right? Can't predict the future. But as far as when will we know, it's hard to say for certain, but, you know, you're absolutely right. Weather so far has trended very far above average. And if you look back at the seasonal outlook slide, um, you know, across the entire East Coast for the, the season as a whole, and that's December through February, which they're considering winter. Um, you know, that's all pinned to be above average for the season. But, you know, to reiterate another comment uh, from that same slide, which is that La Nina macro weather shift, right? Um, and the upside cold risk for any kind of volatility uh, from localized or, or I guess, um, you know, intense winter storm events, such as, you know, an Elliott or a winter storm Yuri, uh, you know, that will, you know, could drive volatility in the near term um, for whatever region it could be impacting, um, you know, but that doesn't necessarily change the fact, you know, uh, of the average, you know, looking at the season as a whole, whether it's above or below average. So something else to take note, it's safest to say, you know, back to your original question, when will we know uh, if, if there is concern surrounding those cold risks, um, you know, once we're kind of in that March timeframe, um, and once we're out of it, it's really the only true, true way to know. Thank you. Yeah, I know I, I put you on the spot there. I understand that. Uh, that we don't have crystal balls. Um, so yep. if, if if somebody is in a renewal point between now and say February or or, um, or March, um, should they be looking at locking in uh, 12, 24, 36 months? What what is your uh, what are your what does your team recommend? Hey Mark, I hey think I yep. <clears throat> so it, again, it depends mostly on your risk tolerance, but it's also going to depend how the winter plays out. If if we're looking at the opportunity to lock in now, we would be able to state that we are seeing some of the all-time low gas prices available on the market. So it's a good time to look at, um, especially 12-month contracts are fantastic, but you're able to extend that lower pricing even further out and dollar cost average short-term bearish pricing further out by taking longer-term contracts presently. Now, could those prices go lower after we get through the winter time and it turns into a super warm winter potentially? Yeah, uh, which is why uh, there's some potential to wait to contract. But at the same time, as Eric was just saying, with a La Nina type pattern, 
that kind of volatility can bring more risk premium into future prices if that weather happens and brings cold down into the area. So if it gets cold, we could see very high demand for short term, causing prices to go up even for next winter or onwards, uh, meaning we should be very careful um, how you want to play that. It, it, all in all, my, my story is saying, hey, if you want to manage your risk and know what your prices are going to be in the future, take advantage of the low prices now and don't wait. And honestly, we can look at long term contracts because um, we don't see prices this low very often. Great. Thank you very much, Dylan. That was Dylan Haas, our uh, Mega's um, NRG representative. Uh, thank you. Um, my next question is for Zane. Um, if, if one of our attendees' power is with another supplier, their electricity supply, um, do they need to move to NRG in order to access the demand response program? Or they can they keep with their current uh, energy supplier? Great question. Uh, they are they are completely separate. You do not need to be with NRG for power supply in order to participate in this program through us. Okay. And then uh, as a follow up to that, is this uh, so? If you participate in demand response, do you get a credit on the electricity bill, or or is there a, some other way to to generate revenue from this? That is another great question. Um, there are there are th three possible ways uh, to get paid. You can just get a simple paper check, um, or the one we like the most is just a direct deposit into a bank account. Um, so when, when you sign a contract, there's some other forms that need to be filled out, um, and, and a banking form would, would be one of them if, if you didn't want to go the paper check route. Um, and then lastly, we are looking to for customers that are electric customers and demand response customers, we are looking to apply, potentially apply that demand response payment onto their electric invoice. We're not quite there yet. Uh, I believe we will get there later next year, but that is an ultimate goal. So those will be the three methods of, of receiving the payment. Okay, thank you. And just let me take a look for any more questions here. Okay, it looks as if uh, that's the end of our questions and that's the end of our Q&A portion of this webinar. And that brings us uh, to, um, I, I'd like to give you uh, our panelists each one, one minute here to just uh, wrap up uh, and then we'll close down the webinar. So let's start with Eric, uh, one minute on a, a, um, a review of what you talked about today. Yeah, sure. I think to, you know, make a high level summary of, you know, gotten to a lot of market information, probably more than maybe a lot of you are interested in. But again, it's important to consider the entire kind of holistic landscape of, you know, where energy power and gas are headed or where they've currently been for, uh, you know, prior to seasons as we head into the winter here. Um, just important to consider. You know, we, we always like to highlight the upside risk and how that kind of ties back into your, you know, as Dylan mentioned, the appetite for risk. Um, when you're looking at renewals or how you're strategizing your procurement. So, you know, feel free to reach out with any questions. Um, you know, me and my team are certainly here to address anything surrounding market insights or intel and how those may drive a decision towards your, uh, your strategy. Great, thank you. And Zane? The, it really comes down to it, this, this is a program where there's no no out of pocket penalties, it is truly pay for performance. The only thing, the only outcome will be you're gonna get some uh, some form uh, of payment. And um, the the other thing I may not have mentioned is, is you can effectively opt out at at any time. Uh, you, you sign a contract, you give it a go for for a couple months because you can enroll in the ISO program. You can enroll at any time. Um, you, you get in the program and, and it's just if it's just not working out if if we see that that you're not performing to your to your ability um, the worst thing that can happen is we just say we're going to enroll you in zero or if you just say we don't want to do it uh, anymore it's just not for us uh, you can tell us at any time to enroll zero in, in, into the program so there there are there are ways out um, and you know, if, if it doesn't work so just the, the last thing is just Get, give it a shot. It's, you know, just 
curtailing HVAC, lighting, getting any little bit uh, of payment back it, it can, can can go a long way. Great. And I want to thank uh, um, our panel today. We've been joined by Eric Lister, the client strategist for NRG East Region, Zane Kirshner, the technical sales team representative for PJM Mid-Atlantic and Upstate New York uh, from NRG, and Dylan Haas, Mega's NRG um, uh, technical sales representative. So thank our panel. I want to thank everybody who joined us today for this webinar. And I'd encourage you, if you have any questions uh, about what we talked about today or anything else, please reach out to the Municipal Electric and Gas Alliance and we can connect you with this expert team from NRG. Thank you all and have a great day.